Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, after uh, a number of COVID tests, uh, which I don't have COVID, but I do have a cold. <laughs> so um, I'm a bit old school. I figure um, if I'm allowed to be here and I have the strength to be here, then I'm here. Uh, but I will not be at the door after or anything like that. So, uh, you know, make sure you connect with uh, the elders and whatnot if you want to chat with somebody after the service. Uh, before we get into God's Word, though, today, and I appreciate Hannah reading, that, that was very helpful. Who knew I would have this cold today? It's even more helpful than I thought it was going to be, so uh, that's great. But I had one more thing, and I meant to actually mention it for the announcements, and then I, it slipped my mind like crazy me, right? Um, but there's a handful of people that I talked to about cutting a Christmas tree. Can, can you guys stand up? I, I, just, just for a second, only so you know who each other is. Well, for sure you two are here. Okay, so uh, you two stay, connect after church, because if I'm still under the weather, I'm not going to be here to do that. Fred, Fred will play point, and anyone else that wants to help chop a chunk of a Christmas tree, see Fred. Um, you know, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Who doesn't want to do that, right? So... <laughs> Some people might even think, boy, Pastor Bruce, are you just avoiding the text today? Maybe. <laughs> this, this is the kind of passage that a lot of pastors say, yeah, let's just, let's skip uh, 18. Just, just verse 18. We'll just talk about the rest. But the fact is, it's God's word, and we want to pay attention to all of it. All of it. And I know that there's some loaded stuff here. So before we dig in, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we look to you, for you are the author of this word. You are the one who has carried it to us. You are the one who gives us understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, today we would be growing and open to what your word has for us that we would not be content to stay the same, but to grow more and more to be like you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this opening, opening verse, right? Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. At this point, it's already risky, isn't it, in our world today? You know what the number one reason for that is, though? Number one reason for that is the way that we use the word submit or submission in our world today is not like how the Bible uses it. That's the number one reason. See, right now, in our world today, the concept of submitting is something you were forced into. So commonly used in like UFC fighting or, or things like that, and they, they try and get somebody in a hold or a choke or an arm bar to the point they can't stand it anymore, and they do what they call submit. It's something that's forced upon somebody. That is not the way the Bible uses this at all. And I would say this is a lot older, so it's actually probably the correct use, okay? Submission in the Bible was always intended be, to be the willfully putting aside myself and putting the interests of somebody else before mine. It's an active decision on the person who says they are submitting, not because they were forced into it, but because they are willfully entering into it. Let me give you a little example. If I was to say... I am submitting my life to Christ. What does it mean? It means I'm putting aside myself. I'm saying Bruce isn't to run the show. It's not about me. I'm saying it's about Jesus, right? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying it's about him. It means I want to make decisions in my life that honor Jesus, that uh, do my best to uh, create uh, the same kind of respect and influence in this world that he does to try and live in his ways. 
follow his teaching. But at any point, does Jesus force that on me? No. No. And, you know, Jesus uses, it's the same language. You know, Jesus uh, submits his will to the Father, prays that the Father's will would be done. It's the same type of language. So what this is saying, first off, is wives and husbands, this is part of your relationship. It is not women and men, to be very clear, okay? (laughs) I've been in churches where it's like, well, all the women have to submit to the men. No, wrong, not biblical. This is specifically a husband and wife relationship, much like what we read in Ephesians, which we are then told is an example of who? Christ and the church. We are to be those that submit to Christ, willingly putting aside ourselves and instead saying, what does he want from us? So that the church is built up, so that he is honored and glorified in our lives. In the same way, Brenda submits to me, putting my best interests at heart. So here's something else that this is. If I say to Brenda, you know what, Um, you know, I'm just going to go and do what I regularly do on Sunday, even though I have a cold, I'm not even going to talk about it, I'm just going to go. Well, Brenda, in her submission to me, says, actually, no, you shouldn't do that. Well, that doesn't sound like submission. Really? Yeah. Brenda, out of submission to me, says, don't do that. That's going to be a mistake. It's not going to go well. You need to love and protect the people. So you show up late, wear a mask, afterwards leave early, don't greet people because you care for them. So, so, so you see, in Brenda submitting to me, she wants my best from me. It's not a suppressing concept. It actually goes back, and I, I, I got my phone going here, <laughs> just because it's easier than turning a bunch of pages. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3. It actually goes back to Genesis chapter 2. God said man wasn't good alone. He needed what? Help. (laughs) He needed help. So a wife is to help her husband. That's what this is saying. And one of the things we don't grasp with this, and it's, it's true of the next verse, husbands love your wives, do not be harsh with them. If only we as men truly grasped this concept. This is love like the selfless love of Jesus for us. A love that covers a multitude of sins. A love that goes the extra mile. A love that expresses grace and forgiveness and walks in humility and never lords it over another. And if anyone had the privilege and the right to be harsh with us or with anyone, it's Jesus, right? If anybody had the right to be harsh, it's him. And yet he loves. He is our example in this. Husbands, love your wives. It's important. Now, why is this important? In Genesis chapter 3, we get what we call the curse. So if you've never read the first few chapters of Genesis One of the things it talks about is the creation of man and woman in God's image, okay? And it talks about sin. And and here now they have sinned. They've done something they weren't supposed to do, and sin enters the reality. And what comes out of it is what we call the curse. Part of that curse, in verse 16 of Genesis 3, says, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. We call this the battle of the sexes. It is the human condition in our sin nature. Brenda's nature, I'm using Brenda and I because that's a fair example. I I don't want to pick on any of you. But in Brenda's nature, if she allows the old self to rule, she is going to end up contrary to me. She's going to be against me. She's going to want to undermine me. And if the flesh is ruling in my life, 
this concept of ruling over her is, this isn't some, you know, benevolent, you know, sort of beautiful kingdom that you read about in a fairy tale. No, no, this is in lostness. This is harsh and lacking in love. But that is our fallen condition to be at odds with each other. What the Apostle Paul is bringing us to here is to bring us back to how we were created to be. That's what happens in Christ. You're made new, given new life. So what we're looking at today, and the first two verses are to do with husbands and wives, but in all of this is actually daily Christian living. It is how do we relate to one another in our faith, in our different relationships. So, wives, it's about counteracting the fleshly desire and the curse. Husbands, it's about counteracting the fleshly desire from the curse. And if I had to put more weight on somebody, it would be on us as men. And that's mainly because if you read in Ephesians, Paul, there he relates it to Christ and the church. And if it's related to Christ and the church, then husbands, our example is Christ. And he is flawless in his example. The bar is high, men. But I expect us to endeavor to it. And here's what that means, guys. If you've not been loving with your wife the way you should be, if you have been harsh, you're to be repentant. This is actually a faith reality. It is a sin condition issue. If I'm not loving with Brenda the way I should, I'm to be repentant. I'm not just to apologize to her for it. That's important. But I need to do business with God over this because the flesh has taken over at that point as opposed to the Spirit. And so I want to encourage you guys, you've got to set the tone. And you need to be the ones who are first to go to your wives apologetically, in humility, repentant to God, and then make decisions in the opposite direction to make sure you're loving. How do you help your wife be all of who God has made her to be? That's your job, men. That's what this love is. Jesus did for us to make us all he has saved us to be. Right? It's that kind of love. So then, don't worry. If you're single here today, there's something for everybody. Don't worry. Children, obey your parents. You notice that here they use the word obey, not the word submit. Children get less of an option here. Why? Because they lack understanding. Our world today disagrees with this, right? Our world today says, no, 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 you got to let the children make their own decisions. That's not what the scriptures say. So, parents, your job is to instruct and guide your children. Kids, you're to obey. But we need to be reminded of verse 21, and it says fathers, but you know what? Fathers and mothers, this both applies to. The principle is the same. The importance is that men, we need to again lead in it in the home, okay? Don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. This idea that we can, because of our over-controlling nature in the flesh again, we can discourage and provoke our children instead of giving them guidance and encouragement. And we are to guide them and encourage them far more than we are to control them. Right? Remember, you're not actually raising children, for those of you that are young parents. Uh, farmers don't tend to raise um, seeds. Some do, but most of them, they, don't, they, they raise the finished crop. Right? We don't, we don't raise um, three-month-old calves. We raise full-grown cattle that sort of thing. You're raising adults. And so your job is to invest well in them, encourage them well, give them good guidance in life. But not that we would be provoking them because we can actually cause them to become rebellious because we lack the insight 
of how do we encourage them. And that, again, is the battle of the flesh and the spirit. So then we get to this next section. I had somebody say, yeah, this isn't for us. We don't have slaves here anymore. Well, some of your translations might say slaves in parts of this. Uh, I think some might use bond servants. The context here is, first and foremost, for us, is the equivalent of the bond servant. And, and the bond servant back in Bible times is somebody who said, wow, financially I'm in trouble, uh, maybe I have a lot of debt i got to pay off, my, my family is going to go homeless and hungry, and they make a deal with somebody for a certain amount of money for a certain amount of years of service. And there's certain guidelines in the Old Testament about Israel with that, but it, went, it was a practice that wasn't only in Israel, it was, it was in other places as well. But it essentially is like going and getting a job. That's, that's what it is today. And so this does apply. And the question is this. How am I as an employee? Do I obey well? Do I do what I'm told well? Am I at work to do my job well? But not just to be a people pleaser. But because I want to honor God. I want to honor God. And let's think about how we live our lives. Some of you might even be here and say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not working for anybody anymore. I, I, you know, I'm retired. I happen to know there's a couple of you in the room that are, that are at that stage. <laughs> but you know what? In everything that you do, do it unto Christ. Do it unto Christ. And I know a lot of you have. I saw people turning up here this week to volunteer with the shoeboxes. And I saw some people here day after day after day, actually, helping with shoeboxes. Why? Was it, was it just because, you know, Pastor Karen said she could use the help? Is it just because the shoeboxes are going to kids? Or is it because the people who showed up said, I'm here to serve Christ in this way? And I believe that's the answer. And, and I think that's that attitude for us. So whether you're at work, whether you're at home in your relationships, this is our focus. You're volunteering or you're getting paid. It doesn't matter. We serve Christ and so I work in a way that honors him. And that's why we read all the way to 4 verse 1 today. I always think it's odd the way they sometimes do chapters and verses, you know, but that way, way predates us. But I almost wonder sometimes if they left masters treat your slaves justly in the next chapter because maybe they wouldn't have got to that if they were just doing chapter 3. Back in those days, they had slaves. The reminder for us in our day, though, we don't have slaves, but there's a number of you here that have had employees. You have employees because you're on a business. You have employees because you hire somebody to do your lawn care. You have employees because you hire somebody to service your furnace or whatever. When you're the one paying the bill, you're going to fit this. How do you treat people? What's your testimony in that? Are you treating people justly and fairly? Is that your reputation when you are the person in control, so to speak? And I think this reminder from verse 25, which says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done. There's no partiality. It's always a good um, thing to keep in mind. But keep in mind that it is not saying that people that do wrong things to their staff or staff that do wrong things as opposed to working properly, that somehow there's an extra judgment awaiting them in the end. That, that's not what this is saying. Okay? What it's saying is that we are not to be vindictive. That's what it's saying. 
It's saying, trust that the one who does you wrong will have that dealt with by the one who judges, namely Christ. We are not to be those that seek vendettas because we get mistreated, whether that is by your workers if you're in charge, by your boss if you're the workers, by your family. We're not to be those that seek a vendetta. Now, don't get me wrong. There are situations you need to get out of because they're not healthy. There are things you need to do because it's uh, an unhealthy and inappropriate relationship. Things are wrong. Nowhere is this saying, um, you know, wives live in abusive situations. Nowhere is this saying husbands live in abusive situations or children put up with abuse that is dished out to you. Nowhere is this that saying this, okay? None of this is advocating that abuse is okay. But rather, that in as much as we can, we are to honor and glorify God in all that we do. And when we live like this, it's a part of the testimony of Christ in us. Because the world says, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. Why is your relationship with each other different than what I see around me? Why do you listen to your parents the way you do? Why do you treat your children the way that you do? Why do you treat your spouse the way that you do? Why do you work the way that you do? And your answer should be to honor Christ. To honor Christ. And I pray that we would each do that in all areas of our lives. You know, the fact of the matter is, I would probably have lost my voice 10 minutes ago if it wasn't for my wife telling me to bring this cup of tea. Because she loves me, right? And I just want us to be a community like this. We're not going to do it perfectly, right? We're not. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to drop the ball. But be those people that endeavor to live in a manner that displays the love of Christ, that displays this type of relationship. Let us love one another well. And and next week, we're going to switch gears. We're going to be moving into... Advent, we're going to talk about hope. So keep in mind this as well. We can, we can talk these principles in households. I was asked before to do a conference on marriage and family in the community that I used to live in. Uh, and, they, and they wanted to invite everybody in the community and, and fill up the local theater multiple times and And then they said to me, but could you kind of maybe not do the Jesus talking stuff that you normally do? (laughs) And I said, yeah, sorry, I'm not interested. Not interested. Because the fact of the matter is, if we teach people, oh, live this way with your spouse and your children, that's great. But if it's not in Christ, it is of no value. And the value of it is in Christ because it displays that you're in Christ. And we get healthier relationships out of it. It's like a bonus, right? It's it's better to live the way God says. But if we teach people this and allow them to not believe Christ, we actually do them a disservice. And so we don't want to avoid it. We want to help people, but... We want them to know Jesus because that is the true source of how this transformation happens. And it's not because I figured it out. It's actually because less Bruce, more the Spirit of God, right? Always. That's always the answer. The more the flesh shows up, the more it's a problem. So I just want to leave you guys with that today, that we would be a people that endeavor to live this way. Not because you like it, not because it's comfortable, 
but because it's good and it's from God. Now, you can all complain to me sometime during the week by email because I'm not going to chat with you after the service because uh, I don't want anybody getting sick. And I, and I already want to thank um, the elders for already like stepping up in some ways to help me today, and I really appreciate it. Um, Wayne was like running around doing stuff for me before the service, and Philip's going to do the benediction, and it's just great having, having a group of elders that are so committed. Appreciate them. Let's pray, and then we'll hand the service back to the worship team. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you. Thank you for the reminders of relationships and how we are to live, to honor you, to care for one another well. These powerful reminders that what is natural to us is not necessarily good. What is uncomfortable to us is probably often a good choice if it follows your word. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn to set aside ourselves more and more for the sake of others. That I would be a leader that always stays submitted to you and that I would love well as an example. Oh Lord, I pray that we would be those people who love you and one another well. That it would be an honor and a glory to our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this congregation, Lord, and for what you're doing here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.